Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I'm very excited to be bringing on Dr. Matt Caberline. He is the CEO of OptiSpan, a Philly professor of oral health sciences at the University of Washington and co-director of the Dog Aging Project. Dr. Caberline's research and interests are focused on understanding biological mechanisms of aging in order to facilitate translational interventions that promote health span and improve quality of life for the people and companion animals. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Aging Association, and the Gerontological Society of America. Dr. Cableine has published more than 250 peer-reviewed papers in the field of longevity and has received several prestigious awards, including the Young Investigator Awards from the Ellison Medical Foundation and the Alzheimer's Foundation. You have a pretty long <laughs> resume. We don't need to talk about that stuff. It's funny because those young investigator you... awards were a long time ago. It's been a while since I've let been a young investigator. You... Let me just give the my my two second overview. You've been in the science community for a long time. A lot about the mechanisms of aging. <laughs> You've been yeah. studying uh, the mTOR mechanism and rapamycin, and so I, I you know, and and. I came across you uh, from a few different ways. I, I saw that you were checking into Self Decode and that you're also, you have these OptiSpan and you're potentially interested in using the polygenic risk scores uh, for this OptiSpan. And so that's how we came across. But I've also heard about you before in your work on aging. I've seen you in different places. And yeah, and because you're in this industry, I just thought, okay, I love interviewing people in the industry who really are on the cutting edge doing really cool stuff. And I just want to pick your brain on, I take rapamycin, for example. I don't take a lot of it, very little. I'm a dabbler, a very uh, <laughs> a small microdosing, like two milligrams once a month or every two uh-huh. months, one kind yeah. of guy. You know what? It's all over the map what people are doing with rapamycin. So we'll talk more about that. But uh, yeah, no, I'm right, looking yeah. forward to this. I can talk about this stuff all day long. So let's dive in. All right. All right. Let's dive in. So let's actually go into rapamycin because sure. I have my, uh, it's basically the most researched drug or supplement or anything. Any, the most researched sub, substance for anti-aging. It has the most evidence behind it. Would you say that's true? I think that's fair. So I don't know if it's been the most researched, but I would say certainly on the preclinical side. So if we're only talking about laboratory studies. Rapamycin is without a doubt the gold standard for pharmacological intervention that affects longevity. And so differentiate dietary studies because caloric restriction has been studied for decades, right? So there's much more data on caloric restriction and and aging than for anything else. But once you get outside of the the caloric restriction literature, and then you start looking at small molecules, supplements, pharmaceuticals, rapamycin certainly is the gold standard in the sense that it has the, the best data. So it's highly reproducible. It increases lifespan and seems to delay aging in every model system where it's been studied from single-celled organisms like yeast all the way up to mice and rats. And it works starting in middle age. And actually, that's really important because that's not true of everything. But with rapamycin, at least in mammals, mice and rats, you can actually start the treatment about the biological equivalent of a 60, 65-year-old person and still get most or all of the benefits. And this has been seen over and over again in multiple different laboratories, multiple different dosing regimens. And that's unique in the longevity field. There's a vast majority of studies where something looks really promising and then somebody tries to reproduce it and it can't be reproduced or the effect isn't quite as big as as it originally seemed like it would be. Rapamycin has really stood the test of time over the last 20 years. And so I really feel like it's the thing that we can have the most confidence in, maybe outside of caloric restriction. We could actually talk about caloric restriction because I would say there's even reason to believe that rapamycin is more consistent across different genetic backgrounds. I know you're a genetic guy with self decode. So with caloric restriction, there's about one third of the genetic backgrounds, even in mice, where caloric restriction doesn't work or is even harmful. We haven't seen that with rapamycin, although to be fair, it hasn't been studied across as many different genetic backgrounds. But certainly from a small molecule drug perspective, it's the best in class right now for a longevity intervention. Yeah, and th- that's really interesting. And and I've read that before, what you mentioned, that it could work 
mostly if you start at middle age or, yeah. and you said even potentially even all, meaning there's, there would be no benefit to taking it earlier than later. Is that? I think we don't know. So what I can say is it appears that you get most of the benefits starting later in life. Nobody, the, one of the challenges with rapamycin is we still don't really know what the optimal dose is for longevity. We know from studies that have been done with the interventions testing program that, that we haven't yet hit the optimal dose, meaning they've gone up and up in dose and it keeps getting longer and longer for lifespan effects. But I don't think we know what the optimal dose is. And without knowing that, it's really hard to do a direct comparison, say, starting at a young age versus an old age. But what I can say is at the same dose, starting at, in middle age gives you almost the same benefit, if not the same benefit as starting at a young age. Okay, that is very interesting. That means that if you're young, it doesn't make sense to take it. You might as well take it when you get older. First of all, yeah, I think we have to be obviously careful about extrapolating directly from mice to, to humans, but it's certainly suggestive that if it works the same way in humans, that, that there would be relatively little additional benefit to starting at a young age. And obviously, the longer you're taking any drug, the more risk there's going to be of side effects, right, that might counteract the benefit. That's one of the really nice things about rapamycin is it seems like you can start in middle age. And I was just going to say, even maybe more exciting than that, there's now multiple studies in mice showing that even short transient treatment periods can lead to pretty significant benefits. In mice, anywhere from six to 12 weeks of treatment, again, starting at about the mouse equivalent of 60, 65 years old, can have profound effects in multiple tissues and organs. So you can reverse functional declines in the heart, reverse periodontal disease in mice in eight weeks, reverse immune dysfunction in six weeks, reverse cognitive decline in 10 weeks, reverse ovarian failure in, in I think, eight to 10 weeks. So it's really interesting that you can have these sort of apparent functional rejuvenations from rapamycin starting in middle age within a period of a couple of months. Now, the question is, does that work the same way in people? We don't know yet, but there's certainly, I think, accumulating evidence that it probably does on about the same time scale, at least for certain aspects of biological aging. You can actually see improvements in six to 12 weeks treatment with rapamycin in people in, in at least certain tissues and organs. Why wouldn't more drug companies be researching this for different conditions like Alzheimer's, some of the conditions that you mentioned? If yeah. you're seeing some really promising stuff in animals, then why would So I think there's two reasons. So for, yeah, so for rapamycin specifically, it's off patent. So there's really no financial incentive to go do the, the large clinical trials to demonstrate efficacy for other indications. There are other versions of rapamycin. There's a family of drugs called rapalogs where there are patent life on some of these rapalogs and there are companies looking at these rapalogs for a lot of different endpoints, but potentially health span related endpoints. But the other problem is because rapamycin was first developed clinically for human use as an organ transplant drug, it got a bad reputation among clinicians and with FDA because it was used at high doses in people who were taking a lot of other drugs. And there were some side effects at those doses for sure. And so it's got a black box warning for that reason. And, and so there's a reputation problem with rapamycin and this class of drugs as a whole because of the way it was developed clinically. Now, that's starting to change. We're learning from people using rapamycin off-label that in otherwise pretty healthy people taking lower doses of the drug, you really don't see much in the way of side effects, but it takes a long time to change a reputation problem when, it, when, it, when a drug is labeled as a dangerous drug. One of my concerns of taking rapamycin is the immunosuppression. The reason why I take it so infrequently is because basically if I'm traveling, I'm like, I'm much more likely to get sick and infection. And so if I'm yeah. suppressing my immune system, it's probably not the great idea. So basically if I'm traveling, if it's the winter and I'm exposed to many people, which is the case currently, I, I have these reservations or if I'm doing a lot of exercise and I'm suppressing my immune system in other ways, I then be like, do I want to take rapamycin now? <laughs> and sure. the excuse is not to take it. And the question is, I guess, like, how much do we know about taking the immune suppression effects and what that can cause in terms of if we're studying this on mice in a cage, yeah, are people blowing on them and getting them sick? I don't know, right? <laughs> uh, how, yeah. how much <laughs> when, when I'm doing acro yoga, people are blowing on my face and <laughs> Uh, it's very easy to right. get sick right. in that context. Uh, when we're doing these studies on mice, are, are they in cages and they're just not getting exposed to infections? Or what's happening there? 
So I think there's a few things to say there. First of all, that's a completely legitimate concern given what I talked about before, which is the reputation that rap rapamycin has as an immunosuppressant. I actually don't think that rapamycin by itself, particularly at the doses that people are using off-label, is a true immunosuppressant. It's an immunomodulator, so it changes the response of the immune system to different. So the couple of things we know about rapamycin in, in mice. During the chronic treatment phase, while the mice are getting the rapamycin, there seems to actually be a shift where the mice become more resistant to some pathogens and more sensitized to others. Again, that's at high doses. So does that mean anything in people? I don't know. But that's the observation. So it's not a general let's immunosuppressant. Talk about what the, let's talk about the human equivalent dosage because there's yeah. the dosage well, where people are taking it. And yeah. I'll, I'll get to the human data in just a second, but I just want to set the stage for what we know. The other thing we know in mice, so we know that with age, the in both mice and people, the ability of the immune system to fight off pathogens declines and the ability of the immune system to respond to a vaccine declines. In mice, six weeks of treatment with rapamycin and then you stop the treatment and then you give a vaccine is enough to fully restore the, the, resp the aged immune system's ability to respond to a vaccine and fight off subsequent infections. So I think what we can say for wow. sure in mice is that transient treatment with rapamycin six weeks rejuvenates the functional ability of the immune system to respond to vaccines and fight off infections over some period going forward. There's pretty good data in people, the same thing probably true. So two clinical trials were done with a derivative of rapamycin called Everolimus that showed improved vaccine response in the elderly. These were healthy elder people, six weeks of treatment, and better ability to fight off a bunch of different types of infection over the next six to nine. It's at least consistent with the mouse data there. So I think that there is this rebound effect, maybe is one way to think about it, of the immune system from a short treatment with rapamycin. I think the question you're asking is when you're taking rapamycin, is there an increased risk of infection? We don't have a lot of data. My guess is there is a slight increased risk in off-label use of rapamycin, and I'll get to the dose in just a second, I promise. We did a study recently, it was published last year in GeroScience, where we collected data from 333 people who'd been using rapamycin off-label, and we compared them to people who'd never used rapamycin. And there, we didn't find any evidence for increased risk of bacterial infection but at least statistically. So it wasn't statistically significant. There was a slight increase. It just didn't reach statistical significance. The only side effect that was more prevalent in rapamycin users was mouth sores. And that makes sense because that's the most common side effect seen in organ transplant patients. About 15% of people taking rapamycin off-label get canker sores. Basically, they aren't severe mouth sores at these doses, but they are like a typical canker sore. Okay, so the dosing here is complicated. It's all over the place, but the average, the median dose is six milligrams once a week. And so that's the most, that's also the most common dose that people are using off label, but there's a wide variation on both sides of that. Some people are taking it daily. Some people are taking it once every two weeks. The majority of people are taking it six milligrams once a week. So I would say at that dose, the immunosuppressive effects for bacterial infections might be real, but they're relatively small. The uh, response to viruses might actually be boosted by that dose of rapamycin. And I think there's a pretty good chance that a cyclic use of rapamycin for say six weeks or 12 weeks could boost immune function generally. So let's get to some of the dosing that we're seeing in animal studies that are being used for longevity, trying to make them equivalent to humans. And what we're seeing the negative effects were in these black box, either black box warnings in the organ right. transplant and just trying to compare right. the dosing. So I think obviously dosing is challenging to compare going from mice to humans. There are these sort of formulas that you can use based on body surface area and things like that. We can start there. And what we know from the studies in mice, so most of the studies in mice have dosed rapamycin in the food. It has to be in an enteric coating because rapamycin is insensitive or sensitive to gastric pH. So it has to get through the stomach to the small intestine. So and most of the time in mice, it's dosed in these microencapsulated formulation in the food at between 14 parts per million and 42 parts per million. Now, what does that mean in human doses? A couple of things to say. One is humans are not taking rapamycin with their meals, right? Usually they're taking it as one pill a day. So the kinetics are fundamentally different in mice delivered this way versus humans. The doses, again, I'm really hesitant to say what that means, but I'd say the 42 part per million dose is probably comparable to 
I don't know, four or five milligrams in a person, maybe not that much, maybe three milligrams once a day. So that's what's different, though. There aren't very many studies in mice where it's been dosed intermittently, like once a week. That's a, a thing that the human off-label use community has adopted without a lot of animal data to back it up, that you're going to get the longevity benefits. And the reasons for um, that adoption in the off-label use community are, I think, at least twofold. One is the studies that I alluded to earlier from, uh, this is work that was done by Joan Manick looking at, at vaccine response. So they looked at um, one milligram a day, five milligrams a week, once a week, or 20 milligrams once a week. And what they found was that at the five milligrams once a week, they got the best efficacy in terms of vaccine response and the lowest side effects. In fact, no different from placebo at that dose. So I think that was one piece of evidence that suggested once weekly dosing in humans could at least give the immune benefits. And then Alan Green, who was the first physician to really go public and advocate for off-label use of rapamycin, settled on six milligrams once a week as his recommended dose. Um, I think, again, based at least in part off of Joan's paper. And so the first few hundred people who started using rapamycin off-label, I think just started using that dose. And so is it the most efficacious dose? Uh, nobody really knows, right? We tried to get towards that in this study that we did, but we just didn't have um, enough data for people taking much different doses to really be able to say with any confidence, are there differences? So it's, an, it's just a lack of data to have any strong conclusions about is that the sweet spot? Are we too low? Are we too high? Would once every two weeks be better? Would one, would daily be better? I think we just don't know. My speculation is that when you go to the daily dosing, you start to uncover some of the side effects that are seen in organ transplant patients. And this is speculation. I don't have a lot of data to support it, but it's my intuition or my speculation that you're probably going to have a slightly higher risk of bacterial infections. You might also start to see a higher prevalence of some of the metabolic side effects. So things like lipid dysregulation and glucose dysregulation. So there's this thing called pseudo diabetes that happens sometimes when people are taking high doses of rapamycin where they can have impaired insulin sensitivity. No evidence for that at the once weekly dosing that I know of, but I think my guess is if you started going to daily two, three migs a day, you would start to see those more prevalent. Also, my speculation is you would also start to see better efficacy for things like autoimmune disorders at those daily dosing. And this is anecdotal, but it comes from talking to a lot of people. I know of several people who have autoimmune disorders who have greatly improved their quality of life taking rapamycin off label. And my impression is usually those people have better success if they're doing like one milligram a day or two milligrams a day mm -hmm. as opposed to six milligrams a week. But unfortunately, it's all that's my gut feeling or that's what I think. But I, I can't say with any confidence because nobody's done clinical trials. That's really interesting. I think like when I experiment with the two, three milligrams rapamycin, what I notice is that it actually counteracts food sensitivities to a certain degree. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think when I look at the research for food sensitivities and food allergies, it's an intolerance, right? It's, and that's the same. It's similar to organ transplant. Your body is not recognizing, your body's recognizing something that's foreign. Exactly. Yeah. I, that's what I was going to say. Not every food sensitivity is due to sterile inflammation, but I think a lot of food sensitivities are. In other words, there's something in the food your body is recognizing as foreign and you're getting an inflammatory response. And that is exactly what rapamycin is most potent at knocking down. I, I wish I understood the mechanisms. I wish I was a, I wish it's some, I was gonna say, I wish I was an immunologist, but I don't really, but I wish I knew more about immunology. <laughs> but I've tried. It's been my observation that with age, we see an increase in sterile inflammation in every, at least every mammal that's been studied. And rapamycin, for reasons I don't completely understand, is very potent at knocking down that sterile inflammation. So it makes perfect sense to me that food sensitivities that are induced, that are inflammatory induced, would tend to be responsive to rapamycin. So that, I, I think that's extremely plausible. Quick question. What is sterile inflammation? Yeah. So sterile inflammation is a kind of another word for autoimmunity. Inflammation is your immune system responding to a challenge, right? Sterile means it's not a pathogen, right? Usually that would be self, right? Okay. So that would be autoimmunity if it was self, but it could also be food, right? It could be something in your environment that your body is 
thinking is a pathogen and responding to, but it's not really a problem. The problem comes from the immune response, not from the, the signal itself. So that's interesting. You're saying that you have a hunch without that much data or based on some anecdotes that you think that this is, and, and based on my anecdote as well, that this would be good for sterile inflammation. Yeah, we know in mice that it is. There, there have been a bunch of studies in mice, including work from my lab, where with age, we can measure an increase in these inflammatory markers in the absence of any pathogen, right, in many different tissues. And that could be driven by a bunch of stuff. Uh, but one cause of this, people believe, is the accumulation of senescent cells, which give off a lot of these inflammatory markers. Rapamycin, again, for reasons I don't completely understand from a mechanistic perspective, but the observation is that in pretty much every tissue where people have looked in mice and you see this increase in inflammatory markers with age, rapamycin knocks that down very potently. Yeah, I think that probably is true in people. I haven't seen as much data yet, but, but it makes sense with a lot of the anecdotal stories that I've heard and my own personal experience as well, that rapamycin can knock down inappropriate immune responses, I guess the way I would frame it the sterile inflammatory response that for complicated reasons accumulates with age in a bunch of different places in our body. Feel free to get into this as much as you want, but I'm curious your personal dosing regimen and also uh, you, you piqued my curious curiosity about your sterile inflammation. Yeah, <laughs> what sure. Do it? Yeah. So, so I'm surprisingly for a scientist, I'm surprisingly non-scientific in my approach to use of rapamycin. <laughs> so what I have done personally is I tend to cycle rapamycin in 10 to 12 week cycles. And that goes, this is actually because of some of the mouse data and the human data from Joan that I talked about, where we think you get a lot of the benefits within six to 12 weeks of treatment and those persist for some time. And so that's what I've done myself. I've done multiple cycles. I've ranged from six milligrams once a week to 10 milligrams once a week. I haven't gone higher than that. The first time I ever took rapamycin was back in 2020, so a few years ago now, and it was driven by uh, uh, something called adhesive capsulitis or also goes by the name frozen shoulder. So this is inflammation of the shoulder capsule. So I had, starting in 2019, I started having a lot of pain in my right shoulder. And I really noticed it like if I was working out any time of pressing, movement, I would have this really sharp pain in my shoulder, but it was really weird. It was like no injury I'd ever had before and that it was extremely painful for like the first four or five reps. And then it would kind of go away. And I, so I thought it was weird because it was, didn't feel like a muscle pull, but it kept getting worse going into 2020 to the point where I couldn't sleep. And then this was, must've been like March or April of that year. My son and I went across the street of a park right across the street from our house to throw a football. And I just, I couldn't do this motion. Like it just hurt wow. too much. Yeah, that was, it was really depressing. That's the first time in my life I really felt old. Like I couldn't go throw a football with my kid. So that's what finally got me to go see a doctor. At that point, I've gotten a lot better, but at that point I was a pretty typical, like almost 50 year old guy. Don't go to the doctor unless something's wrong. Try to avoid it. <laughs> but I finally went and I was sure I had a rotator cuff tear. Like I went to the doc. I'm like, doc, I got a rotator cuff tear. I need to go get surgery. He's like, no, you should go get, you should go get physical therapy. I'm like, no, I don't. I really just want to go get this fixed. He said, no, I want you to go to physical therapy. So I did that. Didn't work. Went back. Finally got an appointment to go see a specialist. And like within 15 minutes, he's like, you don't have a rotator cuff tear. You have adhesive capsulitis. And I'd never heard of this before. And so I asked him, what's that? He's like, it's chronic inflammation of the shoulder capsule. It is fairly common in people of your age is what he says to me. And I'm like, Fuck <laughs> you. That's what I thought. I didn't say that out loud. And then he's like, I can give you a shot. I can give you a corticosteroid shot into the shoulder capsule. I really don't like to do that, at least not at first, because it can de degrade the cartilage and then you have bigger problems down the road. So I want you to go back to physical therapy and see it. And sometimes it'll go away in a year. That's what this guy says to me. Sometimes it'll go away in a year. And I, so I go back out to the car and I'm like, I cannot do this for another year. I was pissed and I was depressed. And, but then it occurred to me, okay, we've been studying in my lab for 15 years, this molecule that's really good at knocking down chronic inflammation. Maybe I should give it a try. So that's why I took it the first time. And I just set up my own N of one experiment. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take six milligrams of rapamycin once a week for 12 weeks and see what happens. And I, again, I'm a scientist. I can't rule out a placebo-like effect. That's always possible. But within three weeks, the pain was noticeably less. And by the end of the 12-week experiment, we were like 95% range of motion back and the pain was pretty much completely gone. And it hasn't come back. So 
I can't prove it was the rapamycin, but the mechanism is just so plausible and the effect was so profound that it's very hard for me to believe that was a placebo-like effect and not a real effect of the drug. So that was the first time I had no side effects. I've never had any real side effects in, in my experience. And so I do this like once or twice you a year. Get sick more often ever or no? No, I've not, like I said, I've never had any noticeable side effects from taking rapamycin. Now, I also can't say that I, that I have had any noticeable benefits other than my shoulder, other than I do absolutely have this perception. And again, this is what I meant by I'm not particularly scientific about this. I like tend to do it about every six months, but that's because I start to notice pain in my elbows and my wrists when I'm lifting weights. And so when I start to feel this joint pain come back, that's when I'm like, oh, I better do another cycle of rapamycin. And it's been my perception that goes away every time, but that I could more easily believe is psychosomatic as opposed to a real effect of rapamycin, but it could also be a real effect of rapamycin. And to some extent, I don't care, right? As long as it's working and doing what I want, that's good. But I can't really say that I would attribute any other benefits to rapamycin other than that, the one very profound effect. This gets to another one of my concerns, actually. So that one of them is being sick more often. Another is we know mTOR is useful for muscle growth and yeah. certain kinds of repair. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm thinking, hey, I'm interested in having muscle, right? And let's say when you work out, you get injured, right? And then the question just is becomes, how quickly do you recover from those injuries? Yeah. So yeah. if you're really healthy, you can recover a lot faster. But you spend, especially if you're not like, you really don't know what you're doing like me. I'm just doing different exercises. I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I'll get injured sometimes doing something the wrong way. Um, yeah. But then the idea is that you recover quickly and that's not a problem. Uh, my concern is that if I take rapamycin, am I going to recover less quickly from injuries or from or not going to build muscle as well? So what I can tell you again is if we look at the animal studies, people were really worried about rapamycin because of exactly what you said, that it's an inhibitor of mTOR. And certainly in the bodybuilding world or in the muscle biology world, you want to promote mTOR activity to build new muscle. We know that mTOR activation is necessary for new muscle synthesis. So there was a concern that rapamycin would actually lead to muscle loss. The data are exactly the opposite, at least in the context of aging. So in both mice and rats, rapamycin treatment actually protects against sarcopenia and sarcopenia is muscle loss with age. So in that context, wow. it seems as though rapamycin is protective. Now it's a different question that you are asking, which is if you are actively doing resistance training, would rapamycin attenuate the benefits of resistance training? I don't know of any data yet. There is a clinical trial that Brad Stanfield just got funded that will start to look at this in New Zealand. I think there's another clinical trial out of University of Wisconsin also looking at muscle function in the elderly with rapamycin. So maybe we'll start to get some data there. That's still not exactly the same question you were asking, though, which is that if you're younger and doing resistance training, would it have a negative impact on your ability to build new muscle? My intuition, again, is not much. It might have a small impact on new muscle synthesis, but I suspect that would be offset by the anti-inflammatory benefits that could potentially go along with it. You need some inflammation with exercise, but you don't want too much inflammation or then you run into counter counterproductive effects. So I'll, what I can tell you is anecdotally, I know a lot of people who take rapamycin off label, and I know several of them have been successful at changing their body composition in a very positive way towards more muscle mass and lower fat mass. That's the other anecdotal thing you'll hear a lot from people taking rapamycin is that it has made it much easier for them to lose fat mass if they try. So I don't think rapamycin is like a weight loss drug on its own, but if people are trying to make this shift in body composition actively, I have heard several people say to me that it was just much easier for them to lose fat mass and retain lean mass. Again, that's purely anecdotal. I have no data to point to. This is just what people have told me. But when you start to hear it from more than a few people, it seems like it could be something that's real. I, I, I don't think there's much risk of having a negative impact on muscle mass, certainly from the kind of cycling protocol that I do, right? This 10 weeks on six months off. I don't think it has any negative impact there oh, and potentially has positive. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do you yeah. Because it takes a while for that inflammation to come back. Again, like I said, I'm not scientific about it. It's not exactly six months. It's like when I feel the joint pain come back, I, then I'm like, it's time to do another cycle. 
Okay, but but I'm saying like, why wouldn't you just continue? I'm assuming you're going yeah. based on some threads of information. It's actually again, we don't have any data in animal models that cycling is better or is more or less effective than continuous use. I don't think we have any any real data yet. So this is more about the potential risks of side effects, which, as I've said, I don't think are super high, but certainly I think the cycling is going to have a lower risk of side effects than continuous use. So that's what I've settled on for myself. I can't really okay. say with any so confidence it's, that it's better or not. Basically, what I'm understanding is you're trying to hit some kind of minimum effective dosing regimen. And because you don't well, have any information now that the cycling is worse uh, or better, you're just going to go for less. and Right. In a sense, yeah. Although what I alluded to earlier with the immune studies is we do know with certainty in mice, and I think with pretty close to certainty in people, that a, a short-term treatment with rapamycin, six to 12 weeks, is enough to restore immune function in an aged context, right? So enough to restore functionality of the aged immune system back to something more like a youthful state. What hasn't, so that is rock solid. What has never been shown is that that restoration of immune function occurs while you're continuing to take the drug? That's an unknown. It might, but nobody's ever done that experiment. This has all been, you stop taking it and then you test immune functionality. So in the absence of that, I feel pretty confident that this sort of short-term dose of rapamycin, and then you stop taking it, will have at least the anti-inflammatory and probably immune benefits. And I don't know whether continuing on rapamycin would have those same benefits. And so that's also part of the equation, at least in my the way I think about rationalizing this. But you know how it is when you're in this sort of biohacker world, you take your best guess, right? And you're working from a limited data set. And so that's what I feel like I'm doing right now. And what I can say is I'm, I'm very confident that it's had some benefits for me and I haven't really seen any evidence of detriment. And so I don't see a lot of rationale to change what I'm doing at this point, but, but certainly open to changing my protocol going forward as new data um, is available. Is there any studies that you know of that this low dosing regimen can change certain biomarkers? So we know that for hundreds of given biomarkers, there's a range where if you have a certain range, it's going to be associated with lower, lowest all-cause mortality, right? And you could argue right. what is causative or not, but you can look at a population and make a conclusion that this yep. range is lowest all cause mortality. Yep. And so I like to I like to try to see the things that are causal, but sometimes things are are not going to be so clear. And so I like to just try to get my ranges in as many of these optimal ranges as possible. Have you seen any kind of data with rapamycin improving some biomarkers in a positive direction, this low dosage regimen? Yeah, not in people. And again, this is where unfortunately there just haven't been clinical trials, or even a lot of biomarker discovery stuff on people using rapamycin off-label to answer that question. So I think we just don't know at this point. Again, I've talked about some anecdotal stories that I've been told around body composition and things like that, but I, I just but haven't seen much. What biomarkers in, in yeah. anecdotes? Meaning, no. if somebody come to you and be like, I've been testing this marker for this amount of time, and then I started taking rapamycin, this marker improved. And that kind of- Yeah, so certainly for- that. Yeah, so certainly for some of the inflammatory blood markers, but not broadly speaking, looking across lipids and metabolic markers and, and things like that. Again, it's an absence of data, though. So there is a trial called the PEARL trial, participatory evaluation something, rapamycin something. <laughs> I don't remember what the A and the L stand for, but this is done by Ageless Rx, and it is a placebo arm and two doses of rapamycin. So these are people using it off-label. But in, so in the, but in the real world, and they are collecting all of this biomarker data. So they are, I, my understanding is in the process of an, analyzing it now. So I think we'll start to get that data. It's not a huge cohort, it's 50 in each group, but we'll start to get towards some more comprehensive data set where people are starting to look at some of these blood biomarkers and they might've even done microbiome. Microbiome would be super interesting. So we showed in my lab that rapamycin could remodel both the gut and oral microbiome in mice. And so it'd be interesting to know whether that's true in people as well. But in the animal studies, I'm surprised that they don't check like blood biomarkers when they're doing these aging studies to see what exactly is moving around. There's not as much, there's actually not as much in the way of blood-based biomarker 
work in animal studies. That's starting to change with the new aging clocks. But even there, a lot of it's not typical that people will follow the even the aging clocks in the mouse studies. Usually when people look at blood-based biomarkers in mice, it's either going to be inflammatory markers or it's going to be insulin and glucose, insulin sensitivity and glucose response. So very sort of rudimentary stuff. Now, in the mice taking rapamycin, the glucose response is interesting. So they actually have, I think, slightly lower blood glucose. A1C is about the same. But if you give them a glucose challenge in old age, they actually perform worse. But it's not, they don't have, they don't have diabetes in the absence of the glucose challenge. They perform worse in the context of the glucose challenge. And so it's been speculated that this might represent an altered metabolic state in the mice where maybe they are using glucose differently or using other substrates than glucose in certain tissues. So when you give them this non-physiological dose of glucose, they just aren't primed to respond to it the same way. But nobody knows whether that's associated with the longevity benefit. Either way, could it be counteracting the longevity benefit and limiting how much benefit you get? Or is it part of the, the mechanism? Nobody really knows at this point. Okay. And so you touched on upon two things that I'm curious of your thoughts. So number one is the microbiome and number two is these aging clocks. I yeah. guess my question is, do you do any of these aging clocks? And if yes, which ones do you think are the most relevant? Yeah. In, at Optispan, as part of our sort of comprehensive diagnostic panel that we're running for the Trailblazer program, we are using multiple biological aging clocks. We're using them as a discovery tool at this point rather than a clinical tool, meaning I don't have a lot of confidence that these clocks are actionable at this point. I also don't have a lot of confidence that they are strongly correlated with each other in the same people, meaning one clock will give you one answer, you pick whichever answer you want, which might make you feel good or bad, but is not particularly useful at this point. So we're really trying to understand, can these clocks be used in the context of the real world, given the sort of state of the art now? And if so, you know, can they be used in a way that's actionable? The one clock that I think that I'm most intrigued by is a clock that measures immune function and immune senescence. It's not yet commercially available. I think the company is going to be trying to make it commercially available in, in the future, but it's, it measures senescent cell burden, T cell activation, T cell inhibition, autophagy inhibition, and then they have their own immune aging algorithm. That one, again, it's a very limited data set, but that one to me seems to line up with some of the other clinical data that we are collecting pretty well. And we have specific hypotheses about how rapamycin should interact with those measurements. So we're actually doing some stuff now where we're testing that and we'll see if those uh, hypotheses prove out. So I'm intrigued by the, the immune aging sort of measurements that you can look at. The epigenetic clocks work really well in terms of large scale human epidemiological data sets. And you can create pretty good predictions with those clocks for five year, 10 year mortality, things like that. I am skeptical that those are going to work at the individual level very well, as in, especially in terms of predicting response to intervention. I, I don't know that. That's my own personal sort of speculation. And I'm really concerned with the lack of information about precision, accuracy, replicability of these direct-to-consumer kits that are going out. My experience is they're all over the place. And I think that makes it hard to have a lot of confidence in the direct-to-consumer market right now. And there's a bunch of these clocks around, right? I, I would like to get your brief opinion on some of them. For example, there's the Horvath clock. There's the doing it in pace clock. Yeah. There's the glycan age clock. Uh, right. There's the pheno age, which is just based on certain basic blood biomarkers. And there was a new one from the UK Biobank. I forgot the name of it, but it was published in 20, October 2023. Yeah. So what do you think of all those clocks? And like, how do you make sense of those? And again, I think, so the first thing I'm going to say is I think you you have to differentiate between whether you're talking about them as a research tool versus a direct-to-consumer tool, right? And this gets to what I was mentioning just a minute ago, which is that regardless of how good these clocks are as a research tool, 
in the direct to consumer market, there is no or very little quality control or information about quality control that all of these different companies that are selling these different tests are using. So it's very hard to have a lot of confidence, even if the test itself is perfectly validated from a scientific perspective, if it's not employed <laughs> the right way, right? Or if, if the quality control isn't there, it's not useful in the direct oh, consumer market, right? So like Dunedin Pace, yeah. right? I think that's a pretty good measure of, I don't know if it's rate of aging. This is the other thing I would say is these clocks are not trained on biological aging. They're trained on mortality or health outcomes. And there's an overlap between biological aging and those things, but they're not equivalent. And so that's one thing just to appreciate is. That was my concern as well, by the way. I was th just thinking, how are you getting this biolog like this rate of aging? What you're, what the studies are actually showing is the mortality, like a five, 10 year risk mortality rate. Exactly. That's right. Showing, how do you actually determine what this rate of aging is? And this is part of the problem is there's a lot of imprecise use of language in the research community around biological aging clocks. And that just gets amplified when it starts getting out into the general public and in the, the direct to consumer community. So I think what these clocks are telling us in a general sense, all of them are measuring to some extent health status, right? And health status obviously is going to be a predictor of three-year, five-year, 10-year mortality. And so this idea that we can quote unquote reverse aging using these clocks, while it sounds cool and sci-fi, all we're really saying is you can improve health, which I think we've all known for decades, right? Of course, you can improve health. If you take a sedentary, overweight 65-year-old, put them on an exercise plan and get them to eat a healthy diet and sleep better, their health is going to get better. Did we reverse aging in those people and make them age backwards? I don't know, but probably not. <laughs> but we improve their health, right? That's what these clocks are measuring. And they all measure them to some extent. I think in terms of the scientific data, the clocks are getting better at, at predicting mortality or in many cases now predicting specific disease outcomes. So in a general sense, like I don't know that I even am up to date enough to do a specific comparison of all the different clocks that are out there. But in a general sense, the newer ones are better at making these predictions than the older ones. But when they start getting marketed in the consumer market, the quality control goes out the window. And so we don't actually know, even if the clocks are great in the laboratory, how well they're being executed in the consumer market. So that's my concern that's there. That's a really good point because my CSO brought this up also. He was saying that sometimes you could publish something because we, we've seen certain people publish something, some kind of polygenic risk score. And my CSO just was like, this is a completely different ball game if you're using this in a yeah. production environment. What right. we're publishing now, he's at, he said, we're actually doing, we're using what's in our production environment for what we're publishing. We're building a QA process around that to make sure that if you ever make a change, that it will match. You, you can have a QA process around that to make sure that the results are still valid. Right. And I think that's exactly the, what should be done in the direct-to-consumer epigenetic space, right? And also, I'd like to see just some validation of these different tests. If you take five of these things and you do three replicates from the same blood sample across all five commercial offerings, how well do they match up, right, to each other and across each other? I don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting question. You guys and are I doing that now in your clinic, you said. You, you're looking at a bunch We're of not people. testing. We're not doing, yeah, so we're not doing triplicate replicates of each kit for each client. We're looking across the clocks. And yes, I can tell you, they oftentimes don't match up. And so I don't know what that means, though, at this point. I think one of the things it means is each of them measures different modalities of biological aging. One thing we're not doing is like five different epigenetic tests. We have one epigenetic test, glycan age test, immune age test, right? They don't always match up with each ac across those different modalities of aging. And I think that makes sense because they're measuring different things, but they're all trained on all cause mortality. So they should be correlated with each other. But at the individual level, I think they're going to be different, right? Because different people are aging in different ways. We each have our own unique aging trajectory. One thing I'll say also that may be relevant is the, I think the glycan age test, again, this is my, now this is just my intuition. Like I, we don't have enough data yet to say this with confidence. The glycan age test, age test is interesting because the baseline glycan biology, I think is very strongly genetically determined. So the end of the age you'll get when it's tried to normalize across everybody 
probably reflects more your genetics than your actual biological age, whatever that metric of biological age means. But I think glycan age is interesting because the delta there may be informative about sort of health status. Again, is it biological aging or not? I don't know. But I think it can't, I think the delta can be informative about health status over time, how it's changing. But I don't think you want to be too concerned with where your baseline glycan age falls. That's my own speculation. And I know the people at glycan age. I'm sorry, Nina, if that's if you if you don't like that. But actually I think they probably would agree with that. So I think all of these tests tell us something different. And I, my I view one, my yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I guess one other issue with these tests that I personally have is it's one thing they're doing research on doing the, the research is based on mortality rate, right? Uh, often, although not always. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah often. The problem is that when you change something and you're lowering your rate of aging or mortality rate, essentially yeah. you don't know if that change was causal or not, right? And that's the same effect where I could tell you, hey, look, there is a lower overall cause mortality if you have a marker in this rate, right? Yeah. And that's interesting, but if you then get it in a certain range or whatever, now you're correlated with lower mortality. Does it mean that whatever you did is actually causing lower more sure yeah Co correlation versus causation i think of course we always need to be cognizant of that i think it is reasonable and i think this is the argument that the biological age community and, and companies would use which is that all things being equal even if you don't know correlation from causation if you get your biomarkers into a place where it is more strongly correlated with longevity that's better than having them in a place where it's right correlated with mortality. And I think that's a reasonable thing to say, but yes, of course, we would love to know, are the things that we're doing causal for mortality or are these markers causal for mortality? The other thing I think about, which I haven't heard addressed as much, is many of these biological aging clocks were tra are trained on longitudinal studies that have been carried out over the past 30 years, right? And that's the only way you can really, because nobody's done going forward 10 years and showing that these clocks actually reflect 10-year mortality. And I, I'm not critical of that approach. That's what you have to do. But I think we need to recognize the environment we live in today is very different than the environment people were living in 30 years ago. And so something that is strongly correlated 10-year mortality 30 years ago, like the obesity rate was, I don't know, half what it is today, 30 years ago, maybe less. So the environment was completely different. And the things that were associated with mortality then may not be associated with mortality now. And so, you know, I, I do wonder a little bit about how well these clocks are going to predict individual mortality risk or individual disease risk going forward, even if they can predict it very well going backwards. Does that make sense? I, I haven't yeah, heard yeah. too many people really talk about this and, and, and think about how we can start to figure out how important that is. It might not be important at all, but it could be really important. You brought up another problem that I, I just thought about is uh, the replication where, you know, when, when you can data mine on a certain population on a certain data set and come up yeah. with a good result. But then the question is, can you use that same algorithm on a completely different data set and you get right. similar results? Right. And, and, and I guess that's probably another problem with these clocks as well is they're not looking at multiple data sets, but I'm not sure about some of them do. So some of them have been validated across multiple data sets. Okay. Some haven't. And I, I think you're right. And and even when they've been validated across multiple data sets, it's usually like NHANES and UK Biobank, which is great. But what about Southeast Asia? Could be completely different. So again, yeah, you're right. I think that there's this oftentimes a, a, an attempt to make a one size fits all algorithm, which may or may not actually work. And, I, and then the other sort of more pragmatic question I just asked myself is right now, given the whole state of all of the information that we have to look at, are the biological aging clocks thinking now for myself personally, but also for our clients and our patients and our employees, are those the things that we want to use to, to tell us whether or not we're improving health span or likely to improve health span? Or do we want to look at the things we're sure are irrelevant for health span, right? I'm not sure that we get a lot of added information from the epigenetic aging clock compared to healthy diet, regular exercise, sleep quality, basic blood biomarkers, advanced blood biomarkers, right, that we know are links to disease, usually through a mechanistic connection, right? And so just from that sort of pragmatic view, I would much rather look at somebody's comprehensive blood biomarkers, 
and DEXA and ultrasound, right? And see what's actually happening and have, be, have confidence in that than look at their epigenetic age and say, oh, you're 10 years younger than you should be. Great. You don't need to do anything. So that's the way I think about where we're at right now. I think there's, I think these tests, in my opinion, they should be used for advanced biohackers, if you will. People who really like, they're testing everything and then they're out of the basic tests and they want to, they want more. And I also think that it's useful, to be honest, in a marketing sense, right? If I tell you I'm doing X, Y, and Z and I'm very healthy, thank you very much. What, am I going to send you 300 of my biomarkers for you to analyze and trust me? <laughs> right? I, I think it's like, yeah, in in the health and fitness world, it, there's a lot of do what I do and you're gonna build muscle like me. Or yeah, yeah, sure. Healthy and me, and it's I want to be like you. And got to show you like one marker that could encompass a bunch of markers. That's how I yeah. see the the idea of these things. I think you're right from a marketing perspective. The question is, are they actually accurate? And we don't know. And what does it mean? And we also don't know. Yeah, I, I guess my view is even for the advanced biohackers, though, if you know what to measure and you've got that dialed in and then you take your biological age test and then let's say it comes back 10 years older than you actually are, what do you do with that information? Do you stop doing the stuff you know works? Because you're I, like, I don't know. This is where I'm not, I'm just not sure what's actionable here. <laughs> Yeah, right. maybe yeah, it's great to put up a leaderboard and yeah. say, I'm number seven in the world on my epigenetic age test, right? right. Great. Right. That makes you feel better. Fantastic. But I don't know how useful it is. No, I agree with that. It's what you could, to play devil's advocate a little bit, I agree with you, but what play devil's advocate, I would say that what you could say is, let's say you have that leaderboard, you could say, okay, this person's doing X and this is their score. This person's doing yeah. Y and this is their score. And eventually you can start building trends by just looking at what different people are doing anecdotes, of course, but. Right. Um, no, I would, I agree know. with that. I think if you could get tens of thousands of people doing that, sharing like their protocols and these scores, yeah, then maybe you could actually start to get some confidence, right? Even then though, I don't know. I guess my, I guess personally, my thought would be, would I want to adopt a protocol that somebody else is using because it has moved their aging clock in a certain direction if it didn't line up with what I thought was most beneficial, right? If you already know what to do, right? Are you going to change that based on somebody else's aging clock? Again, I don't know. I, I, I think what we're really discussing here is what is the right set of biomarkers to assess? And are the aging clocks in that group? And I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just saying, I don't know the answer to that yet. I feel a lot more confident about body composition and blood glucose and the, the sort of standard stuff. Yeah. Blood pressure, right? Infl That's inflammation, time, right? Like, CRP. Yeah. yeah. Blood pressure is going to tell you a lot more than any clock out there, right? If your blood pressure is high, I don't care what any clock says. That, that's, there's way more data on that. That's absolutely, especially if it's high. Like, again, this is also, I think, an important nuance though. If your blood pressure is low, then the other biomarkers are going to become relatively right. more important. Yeah. If your blood pressure is high, fix it, right? Fix the, exactly. So that's also like, how do we rank the importance of these things to prioritize? Where do you focus your attention first? Right. So, and, um, and, I, and well, I think what I can say with confidence is the epigenetic age clock should not be at the top of your list of things to fix first. <laughs> right. <laughs> and by the way, there's all these other tests with organic acids. I'm like, I'm not even there yet still. So here's the thing about the aging clocks that I, I don't think a lot of people recognize, which is that if you have... If you take any phenotype that changes with age in a predictable way across the population, as long as you can measure that phenotype with high enough dimensionality, right, enough dimensions to your measurement, if you think of your measurement as a vector, like epige epigenetics is perfect. There are tens of thousands of specific epigenetic marks you can measure in the genome. That's extre extremely high dimensional data. As long as you have enough dimensionality to your data, you can build a really good aging clock because you just pick the subset of data points that correlate most strongly with chronological age. And then you look for you know people that are off that line. So you can build aging clocks on a bunch of different stuff, right? You can build on the microbiome. So biome has their own aging clock. Again, I'm not going to comment on how good or bad that is. But I don't think we know yet. They have an aging clock. You can build it on images, facial images, right? You can build it on the eye. So we've got a device here that we're, we're playing around with now. It's just a fundus camera. You can build retinal aging clocks. 
So you can build clocks off of all sorts of different data. I think the interesting question is, if you had 25 clocks, all measuring aging different ways, different phenotypes, again, how well would they correlate with each other? And where they don't correlate, what is that telling you about the biological process? That's super interesting, but there just isn't, we're so early in the game that we don't really have even, I think, the hints of the answers to those questions at this point. What's your opinion on organ age? Yeah. Pretty skeptical of what that means. That's why I want to get in what way? Opinion. I just don't understand what organ age means. Meaning, let's uh, say, like, my HSCRP is at the age of a 10-year-old. I'm like, yeah. well, you could be 100 years old and still have an HSCRP yeah. of 0. Yeah. 0.2. It doesn't tell you your age. of. I think the idea that our organs are aging at different rates, um, there's some validity to that. Certainly, from a pathological perspective, we know that pathology can, in, in different people, will happen in different organs at different rates. And some people, the kidney will go first and some people, the brain will go first, right? How do you measure right? that? Yeah. So there are a variety of ways you can measure it. So you could pick one biomarker, right? You could pick one biomarker of heart function from the blood. So that's going to be my measure of heart age. And then you can go out there and say, I've got a heart age of a 10-year-old if you wanted to, right? But there's no scientific validity to that. So I think a better way to approach that would be to look, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, like within a comprehensive blood panel, we've got a renal panel. And so you could take that and come up with an algorithm that is probably, I don't know if it gives you age, but it certainly gives you function and function declines with age. So you could come up with a functional measure. So then you could take, and what people are starting to do with the epigenetic clocks. So within blood, you can detect DNA from all sorts of different cells and tissues, right? That are being shed. So in principle, you can based on the epigenetic profile that we know is specific to different cell types, you can create epigenetic clocks for different organs and tissues from a single blood sample. And, and so that's what, that? uh, I don't know if they've been commercialized yet, but there have been papers on the research side published okay. that can give you uh, estimates of organ epigenetic age from a single blood sample. Again, I think the question is how actionable is that? But if you could, I actually think this is probably more promising than the single epigenetic age tests, because if you can use that at an individual level to say, okay, you look good everywhere except your kidney. Let's do a deeper dive and figure out if there's a problem with your kidney. To me, that's actionable. That is really valuable if it works. So I'm a little bit more enthusiastic about those kinds of tests than I am about the sort of single number, here's your biological age kind of nonsense that people are talking about that, now. That makes sense. And my last question, and this is something I've been struggling with, is microbiome. You mentioned it. Yeah. Besides like butyrate production and a couple basic stuff, what are you really getting? Do you use that in your clinic? What yeah. You for microbiome? What's the actual? Good, actual good question. So we are not yet decided on where we are going to land on the microbiome. We think it's very important, uh, but we haven't yet figured out who we're going to work with or, or what the right way is to use that data. I also would say, I think it's really valuable for people to appreciate when most of the time when people say microbiome, they're thinking, thinking about the gut. And so usually you measure that in poop, but there are other microbial communities in our body that are super important. I think the oral cavity is often massively underappreciated. And if you have dysregulation of the oral microbiome, periodontal disease, you're at higher risk for dementia and cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So there are connections here. So I, don't, I wouldn't, first thing I would say is, I don't think we want to focus only on the gut microbiome. That's the thing that is most well characterized at this point. I think you're right. So there are a few sort of interesting mechanistic things that people can point to, like butyrate production and come up with complicated ways that could impact physiology. I don't know yet. I, I, what I would say is, I think we can get signals from the microbiome that tell us generally about changes that are characteristic in the microbiome with age, which probably reflect immune function. And if we can modify those changes, that again would be at least consistent with better gut health and effects on aging. The thing that's complicated here is the microbiome signals to the immune system and the immune system signals to the microbiome. So if your immune system is impaired, your microbiome is going to be deranged, right? And so I don't know if it's a direct measurement of immune function or microbiome function. So I, I, I think it's just too early. We're interested in, can we, can we use the microbiome to learn about individual health risks and individual nutritional strategies? I'm not yet sure that we're beyond the point where we can just say, eat more fiber. 
<laughs> we need to get beyond that point. I'm not sure we're there yet. The guys at Viome will tell you, we're this close to having a personalized nutrition plan from your microbiome. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I think there's the potential to get closer to something like your microbiome is here. Here is a personalized nutrition plan that we think will move your microbiome in a way that will be more conducive to health. I don't know if that's five years down the road, 10 years down the road. I think we're closer to that. I also like the idea of using the microbiome as an early predictor for health problems. And I think there are some reasons to think that might be possible. Again, Viome has an oral cancer detection test that's FDA approved. That's an interesting case example of how in the microbiome, the oral microbiome, you can actually detect signals of oral cancer. There may be opportunities to do that with other microbial communities. So lot, lots of potential. It's very early days, I think, in the microbiome research world. Very interesting. Uh, I really uh, appreciate you coming on and enlightening me about these different tests because there's so many tests out there now, right? And, and I think people get confused about what they need to do. And I think what you're doing is, is really cool. You're trying to filter out which tests are good and useful and, and trying to come up with a, a system that is filtered, right? Filtering out yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> Hopefully. Again, I think the signal to noise is real, really challenging. It's challenging for me and I know the science, right? To the extent that we can really focus on what's the lowest hanging fruit, what's the most impactful diagnostics we can use to move the needle in the right direction for as many people as possible. That, that's really what we're all about. And I think we need to be honest that it's a learning process. We're going to evolve as we go. So we're, we might land on a certain answer today and recognize that can change over time. And it should change over time as technologies improve and we get more data. But, but, but we're really trying hard to be honest about what we know, what's speculation and, and, and what is you know, really not supported by the science at this point. Last question. What do you think somebody who is really like, how much can somebody maximize their health span or lifespan in your opinion? Yeah, it obviously depends on where you're starting from, right? right? But I would say if you look at the typical American, I really believe that and it depends a little bit on how you define health span. This, that, this is a longer conversation. Maybe we need to come back and do that. But I think for most people, you real, most people are leaving uh, in America two decades of health on the table, right? Just based on lifestyle. So I think there are real huge opportunities for most people to, to have a substantial impact on their health span. Now, if you're talking about somebody who's dialed in, and I think you're probably pretty dialed in, you know, then I don't know the answer to that. I think that's where it gets harder, right? So once you've got most of the stuff dialed in, what do you do to get that little bit of extra health span? And those are the people where then I start thinking about things like rapamycin or supplements, things like that. So the way I would frame it is, Get the fundamentals in place first. Don't expect rapamycin to be a cure-all for a bad lifestyle or whatever your favorite supplement is. Once you've got that dialed in, then you can really start to focus on those other things and see if they move your biomarkers in the direction that we think they need to go. I love that. That's the approach that I take. That's basically what I've done my whole life. I started out doing all the basics and just as time went on, I've been in this field for 16 years. It's just been getting more and more advanced and yeah, and that, now I'm more in the cutting edge trying to figure out yeah. the, the more, any additional advantage I could get. <laughs> and this is the challenge, right? And I see this a lot with the people who are in your position, then you have to try to balance the rush to try the new thing, right? So there's always this, oh, there's this new cool thing. This paper came out. Let me try it. And where is the line where you're, you, you, you have enough confidence that it's real and it's not going to be harmful? And I think that's the balance that a lot of the hardcore biohackers struggle with is then they want to just jump right off the deep end with the next paper that comes out. And I kind of land, let's get some, let's get some more data before we do that. All right. It was great talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Lots of fun. And uh, let's do it again sometime. All right. Awesome. Looking All right. Take care, man. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show. So please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad 